Tonight, new legal challenges could affect the state's plan to execute its remaining death row inmates this week. Arkansas officials say right now they are preparing to move forward. Jack Jones Jr. and Marcel Williams are scheduled to be put to death tomorrow night. Both have appealed the decision by District Court Judge Christine Baker, who denied their requests to block the executions. DOC director asked inmate Lee if he had any last words, and uh, she actually asked him twice, and he, he did not respond. The inmates have argued that the drug midazolam could cause complications, possibly leading to a botched execution. But witnesses say it appeared the execution went as planned and Lee did not suffer. The inmate appeared to lose consciousness very quickly. Um, didn't, I mean, within a matter of minutes, his eyes closed. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, former New York City prosecutor and retired FBI profiler and writer producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. Lisa and Laura are out doing their thing in different parts of the world right now, but I have a very special guest with me, uh, the return of James Clark from Amnesty International. How are you doing, James? Good. How are you? I'm good. Can you remind the, the listeners what your title is at Amnesty? Sure. I'm our senior campaigner for death penalty abolition. Okay. Well, I hope you're having some success in that area. I'd like to... Uh, talk to you again about what we were talking about, the sort of debacle of Arkansas, and uh, find out if there are any other Arkansas's out there, uh, as well as um, find out what's the state of the situation on the laws concerning death penalty in the United States of America. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, great. So why don't we start off with Arkansas? Uh, why don't we sort of do a quick recap of what was happening before we talked last time? And uh, and then maybe tell us what the results were. Sure. So um, last time I was here was, uh, I guess, early April. And Arkansas had just scheduled a series of eight executions to be carried out over the course of 10 days all mm -hmm. throughout uh, the month of April. Um, and that was based on the fact that the drug that they were using to carry out these executions was expiring in a very short period of time, and they wanted to use all the doses they had before the, they expired. That's right. That's right. They had exactly eight doses of one of the chemicals that's used in a lethal injection. It was set to expire at the end of the month of April, so they, that was uh, the end of their supply. Uh, so they scheduled eight executions to use up every dose. It was the first time they'd had an execution in over 10 years, uh, so, that, so the death penalty had been on hiatus for quite a while. Uh, but because of this expiration date, they really um, jumped at the chance to to schedule as many as they could. Yeah, wow. So I remember when you told me that, I was very distressed because it sounds like an asinine reason to execute eight human beings. Um, you know, putting aside, uh, you know, death penalty arguments, putting aside what these guys may or may not have done, the fact that they would execute eight people after 10 years of not executing anybody simply because the drug was going to expire, it just, I, I don't know, it boggles my mind. Yeah. I mean, asinine is a good word for it. Um, some legal words we might use are arbitrary or capricious. Um, you know, when the death penalty was ruled unconstitutional in 1972, that was the basis that it was arbitrary and capricious. And um, the famous quote is that, uh, from from the Supreme Court justice is that um, when you or when the de the death penalty is arbitrary and capricious, like a lightning strike is arbitrary and capricious, and there's no telling which murderers will be executed. They reinstated the death penalty in '76 under the you know apparent belief that the new death penalty system eliminated that arbitrariness. Um, but I think what we've seen pretty much all the way through since the 70s, but especially the, these cases in Arkansas really demonstrate that arbitrary nature of who gets put to death. Right, uh, because you got to figure that if they had scheduled them out normally, that those executions would have been spaced out over weeks and months, even years. Who knows what would be the changes in law or the governor or facts and circumstances that would come out over that period of time. If that didn't happen all at once like that over the course of 10 days, some of those lives may have been spared. Right, right. And, and I think that's what we saw. What we saw over the course of the 10 days with 
with the eight executions. So in the end, four of those men were put to death and four of the executions were, um, were stayed or, or an injunction was put in place. And in many of those cases, we see again, it was, it was arbitrary, yeah. you know, it was the, all, all kinds of bizarre reasons determined which of those eight men lived and which died. And as you just said, the fact that they scheduled them all together in that condensed span for that rapid pace was part of what contributed to, to determining who lived and who died. And it, it put all of these additional pressures on the system. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Why were four men spared and four men killed? So let's go through each of the cases, because obviously there's there's a lot of details involved in each one. Um, so the the first execution was scheduled for April 17th, and those guys were Bruce Ward and Don Davis. Both of those executions that night were stayed. There were So I, I actually traveled down to Little Rock and was there working with activists on all of these cases. And we were paying close attention to, to all the court battles, obviously. And especially in those early days, um, there were just so many legal briefs being filed in different courts by different parties. Even the drug companies got involved and the drug right. companies sent a team of lawyers to come battle against the state to say, you can't use our product in this way. Right. I mean, that that is a side issue and we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, the drug companies did not intend for their drugs to be right. used to kill people. Right. They're right? life-saving medications. The right. drug companies make these things to save lives. Right. And so it sort of really hurt their brand. And therefore, I think, you know, they did have standing to to at least try to get these things stopped. But right. anyway, go right. ahead. So these so two... that the, the, the drug company um, uh, suit was successful for, for a while. And um, and there were there were other issues that were being filed that were also successful. So there were a number of stays in place. Some of those stays applied to the individual guys. Some of them applied to all eight because they're based on the drugs. And so for that first execution date, a couple of different stays were in place and both of those guys had their execution averted. Now the death warrant, when they when they schedule an execution and they get a death warrant, mm -hmm. it's only good until midnight the night of the death warrant. So once a stay was in place at the stroke of twelve, those guys are now safe. For right? now, right? For now, for now, of course. And but but now the other piece is the drug expired at the end of April. So they're safe until Arkansas can acquire new drugs. So all of these, the, the timeline is it's just arbitrary. It's yeah. bizarre. It makes no sense. So so Bruce Ward and Don Davis had their execution stayed on the 17th. The next two were scheduled on the 20th, and those were Stacey Johnson and Liddell Lee. And um, this, I think, is one of the best examples of the arbitrary nature of, of what happened. Both of those of those gentlemen had similar claims. Um, they both suffered from intellectual disabilities. Uh, and and um, had cases in which um, expert testimony in their original trial had, had been called into question or their access to experts had been called into question and, mm -hmm. and all kinds of specific issues of their cases. But the prosecutors simply stopped appealing the rulings in the case of Stacey Johnson. The, the uh, one court issued a stay and the prosecution appealed Liddell Lee's stay, but they did not appeal Stacey Johnson's stay. So as a result, Stacey Johnson, um, his stay was was kept in place, and Liddell Lee's stay was not. Liddell Lee's, the, the prosecution's appeal was successful, his, his stay was cleared, and Liddell Lee was put to death. And why? Like, why was one successful and one not successful? I can't tell you. I have no idea why the prosecution decided to to pursue one case and not the other. It, I mean, I, I, I can tell you what we were speculating when I was talking with the local activists on the ground. In the beginning, it really seemed like they had tried this scattershot approach, you know, throw everything on the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. And um, especially after the prior night, no one had been executed, which caused a lot of disappointment on the part of the state and the prosecution. Um, so I, I kind of had the sense that they were wanted to focus, wanted to just pick one and go, and, and that that one would be easier to get than if they tried to get two at the same time. Really? And so, you know, again, from my pers very limited perspective, it really seemed like a completely arbitrary choice. Like, they just decided we need one, not two. And, and this particular defendant, he was mentally challenged? 
I, I don't recall all the details of, of Liddell Lee's particular circumstances. Um, of, of the eight, six of them had mental or intellectual disabilities or mental illness. And while we're talking about this, were any of these eight defendants wealthy? No, no, okay. of course not. Every single one of them relied on free attorneys and, right. and public assistance. So not a single one of them had private attorneys? No. no. And even in the death penalty process, did they have pro bono like law firms that came in to, to their aid? That's a great question. They had pro bono law firms that came to their aid when the governor scheduled aid executions in 10 days. Only because of that. Right. And, and it was so last for, minute. Right. So for 20 years, these guys in many cases had completely overwhelmed and incapable counsel. Counsel that were dealing with a, a, a tidal wave of death penalty cases and they could not provide the basic assistance that these guys needed. And that's what, when the ACLU came in, the ACLU represented a couple of the guys. Um, I, don't, I don't recall which ones. But when the ACLU came in right at the end, you know, a couple of months before the execution, they uncovered so much, so many cases of, of um, things that their previous counsel had missed. Really? You know, appeals that had just not been filed and issues that had not been presented that were that could have been presented and could have made a difference. But it's not until... Then at the at the end, after they'd been there for, you know, in some cases up to 20 years, that they finally got good, quality, committed, resourced counsel. Right. But because it's at the 11th hour, they couldn't actually guarantee that the rights that they hadn't exercised had actually, you know, enough time, sufficient time to file the motions and actually get those rights exercised. Right. That's exactly right. And, 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 and you know, in the cases of four of these people... Um, they, they never got sufficient legal assistance to really make their case. You know, that's one of the things we talk about in the United States, that we have all these protections in place and we have a constitution and due process of law and, and we're committed to upholding everyone's rights. It takes a really expensive lawyer to go into a courtroom and defend your rights. Absolutely. It, On a death penalty case. Absolutely. But here's the thing. And I, and I have to say this, and I, I certainly want to say this to our listeners that I'm not discounting the fact that these guys are convicted killers, that they have victimized people. And we, on this podcast, we basically champion the rights of the victims. That's not the case. The case is that, that we're talking about this because it's a flaw in our justice system. And because of issues like this, like Arkansas trying to execute eight people in, in 10 days, because a drug was expiring, that doesn't sound like justice to me in any way, shape, or form. And the fact that it's arbitrary where one out of two would be killed and the other one wouldn't, it just it seems like that is a textbook definition of arbitrary. It's a textbook definition of a system that's broken, that doesn't work. And it's causing uh, people to be killed who might otherwise not be. Well, I, I'm really glad that you brought up the victims. And we talked about that last time I was here. And, and one of the things I said is that, you know, there's no one size fits all solution for how people deal with violence in their lives. And some people want execution, but but some victims don't. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the next cases, the, the scheduled for execution on the 24th was Marcel Williams. And the victims in, in the case of Marcel Williams murder came forward and they asked for him to be spared. Really? And they did not want execution in his case. But the governor ignored them and really? continued to put up the faces of those victims who did want execution and continued to claim that the victims were the reason he pursued execution. But in, in and they, and he's not Marcel Williams isn't the only case where that happened. Um there were there were several victims' families in this in these cases who came out and they said, This isn't justice for us. This is revenge. This doesn't make us safer. Right. But those weren't the victims that the governor decided to listen to. Really? So in that case, although the victims specifically asked the governor to grant clemency, the governor ignored that and continued to pursue and, in fact, killed some of them? That's right. That's right. And um, Marceau Williams, is the he was the first of those. And his case is, I think, of the eight, perhaps the most shocking and appalling. Why is that? Marcel had a, I'm sorry, um, throughout his life, since he was a very small child, Marcel was 
brutally sexually abused by his by the guardians by his his mother and his and and the other adults who were responsible for taking care of him he was he was sex trafficked mm. his his mother um sold him for sexual use by other adults starting at the age of 9 and um throughout his life from that point onward he was the victim of just grotesque sexual physical mental emotional abuse um his teacher so the, the the victims in in his case understood that some of them some of the families of the victims understood that and understood that he had been so failed by by everyone in our system he had a teacher who came forward who who spoke at his clemency hearing um and and spoke about the wonderful boy that he had been as a child who had just been brutalized and none of none of that moved the governor or the courts to see his crimes in a larger context of of him as a human being um so so marcel williams was put to death and that same night uh jack jones was also put to death um, that was the first double execution in the United States in, uh, I, I think, since 2005. Texas did the last one. Um, and I'll just I'll pause as I'm going through the list of, of these guys. So I was, I was there that night, and we had a vigil. You know, each time we, one of these executions happened, we, we put on a vigil. Mm-hmm. And I've been to a lot of execution vigils over the years, but I've never been to two in a row. And that is, that is a truly bizarre and horrifying experience. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes. No best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I even had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. There are two final executions scheduled for Thursday as well, Kenneth Williams and Jason McGeehee. However, McGeehee's execution has been put on hold after the state parole board recommended clemency for him. Can we take a minute, though, and talk about Marcel Williams and and the crimes that he committed. Sure. Um, It's my understanding that he abducted a young woman at a gas station, forced her to take money out of an ATM, um, and then eventually raped and killed that woman. A horrific crime. But I want to talk about something that you said earlier, that the fact is that he did suffer abuse throughout his life. And from the time he was um, nine, I think you said that he was sexually abused and actually sold for sex by his mother. And I want to, for our listeners, I I know you've heard me say this before, that being sexually abused doesn't make you an offender. And I stand by that. But when you have a situation where a young child like this, at nine years old, is sold for sex by the the one person in his life that should be protecting him, um, and that he has basically been immersed in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation of violence. It's ingrained in his life because it goes on over time. He's completely helpless. Um, it becomes part of that person's nature at that point. It, it's, it, it's a way of life that he may have learned. And I'm not excusing his behavior. And I do not in any way, shape, or form believe that because someone is victimized that they automatically will go out and victimize someone else. But 
in some cases over a long period of time when it has become basically a way of life for them, it can become their go-to response um, to any given situation. Well, and I think, you know, one thing it's so important that you just said, being victimized doesn't make you an offender. And I think that in ideal circumstances, already once someone's been victimized, there's no ideal circumstance. Mm. But but if things can be on track from there, right, there are so many opportunities that we have as a society to intervene for help, to provide people with the help and support that they need. Mm -hmm. But if we miss those opportunities, right, if we fail collectively as a community and as a society to give children, to save children from a lifetime of abuse, to intervene in the, in the critical moments throughout their life as they progress through adolescence and into adulthood, to provide care and support and, and treatment and mental health care and, and all of the things that they need in order to reintegrate, right? Once, once you've been victimized in that way, your integration into the wider community and into society has been has been well, taken and broken. Yeah, well, one, we know that that once a child is victimized, there's a seventy percent greater chance that they will be re-victimized. Right. I mean, by a completely separate set of individuals or or person, and so yeah, it does set kids up for difficulties. And because of the fact that the vast majority of kids don't report. The average length of time it takes to report is 20 years, and 25% wait 30 years to report, and therefore it's very difficult to get those services to them. But in this particular case of Marcel Williams, it's much more than just society failing to, to step in and help this kid. His mother was selling him for sex. Right. He was being abused not just by somebody sneaking around. But his mother, who is charged with protecting him, who gave him life, for Christ's sakes, is selling him for sex. That can't have a positive effect on him. And the fact that over and over and over, year after year after year, this went on. Right. I have to say that this had to have affected him mentally and certainly must have affected him in terms of how he responds to any kind of stressors. Right, right. And, and when we talk about the death penalty, we're, we're saying that he, he shouldn't be executed. We're not saying he shouldn't be punished right. or, or dealt with in an appropriate way, right? Incarcerated, provided health care, pr- kept away from the rest of us so that we can create a safe community. Of course, accountability for, for everyone's crimes is, is important. Of course, mm-hmm. that's justice. But the question is, does he deserve to die? for having committed this crime at this point in his life, in this life. And do we not go back and say, what happened to his mother? What justice did he get for having been victimized repeatedly, year after year after year, by his mother and by the people that she sold him to? Right. It's hard to reconcile this situation. And I understand why this is such an emotional case for you and for so many people. The fact is that we have to stop being violent if we're <laughs> going to hope that our society isn't violent. God, I mean, we, you know, I, in my, I, I say cycle of violence a lot, and every time I say it, I kind of feel like it's a phrase that has lost it's meaning. meaning. Um, and it and sounds like an almost academic phrase, but I mean, you're exactly right. We respond to violence with violence. We, we kill people and we say that that is justice. And it just is mind boggling to me, too. And I, I certainly I, I can't wrap my mind around how people see that as taking us to a place of safety and accountability. Right. I just don't understand that. To me, one of the reasons why I am not for the death penalty is because I just cannot get, wrap my brain around the state in a cold and calculating way taking somebody's life. Um, it's not in the Constitution. It doesn't say that we're creating this government to 
take people's lives, but it's actually we created the government to protect people's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I get it. If these guys killed people, they took away other people's rights. I totally understand that, and that's what punishment is about. But retribution, I don't believe, is in the Constitution. Retribution is something that, well, we try to to teach our kids that, you know, to be bigger than that, that forgiveness is a much more powerful human emotion, a much more honorable human emotion. Mm. Why is our state engaging in retribution when there's ample evidence that it is not preventative. I mean, that's the question, isn't it? I I, I don't have an answer. I, I mean, I think that it's politically expedient. I think that there's a lot of people who, who are looking for retribution and who, um, who like, like it when they see it. Um, but, you know, I think you're right that certainly the evidence of creating an effective uh, justice system that values safety, I think would certainly value forgiveness over retribution. Um, but that's, it's hard. You know, it's a very hard thing to come to forgiveness in the case of violence. But that actually, uh, I'm, I'm glad you said that too, because that brings me to um, the, the last couple of cases who uh, were scheduled for execution on the 27th. They were Jason McGee and Kenneth Williams. So Jason McGee's uh, execution had actually been stayed early on, um, and he had a, an injunction in place preventing his execution because his mental illness was so profound as to be beyond dispute. I mean, several of the guys had mental illnesses, but Jason McGee's was so profound. He did not understand that he was going to be executed. He did not understand the purpose of, of his imprisonment or of his execution. He believed that he was being persecuted by Satan. Wow. So, um, that level of, of mental illness was was recognized in his case and, and his execution was put, prevented. Um, but Kenneth Williams was the other of the, of the last ones. He was executed. Kenneth Williams had um, escaped from prison uh, several years ago. I, I can't, I think it was the early 2000s and um, stolen a car and escaped and, and was fleeing when he got into a car accident and killed two people in the commission of his escape. One of them was Michael Greenwood and Michael Greenwood's family just did some of the most incredible advocacy I've ever seen to try to save um, Kenneth Williams life. And they wrote, they wrote letters. They, um, they actually paid for Kenneth Williams daughter to come who had been adopted as a child and had never met her father, but had recently begun, um, corresponding with him mm. had never met him in person and and they paid for her to fly to little rock to see her father for the first time before he died uh kayla greenwood was was michael's daughter and she wrote a letter on behalf of their family that said just what you said that this is retribution this is revenge my family doesn't need this my family doesn't want it my family she she wrote how the the healing that her family found in forgiveness. Mm. They actually, I mean, they, they, they communicated with the governor in a variety of ways, but they wrote that letter and they allowed me to deliver it to the governor's office. Um, and all the activity that we did, I think that was, you know, one of the most profound things I've been a part of. And what was the result of that? The governor issued a statement saying that he received the letter, um, but that he didn't change his mind. Uh, he didn't really say much more than that, except to sort of reaffirm his basic support for executions. Um, and, and so Kenneth Williams was executed. He was the, the, the fourth and the last of the men. What was his original charge before he escaped from prison? You know, I don't know. Was it a murder? I, I don't believe so, but I, but I can't tell you. Was he on death row before? No, no, no. He was sentenced to death as a result of the, the killings and the commission of his escape. So what? So they they called that a felony murder. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. That's. I mean, I think that's actually common around the the U.S. in death penalty states that felony murder, murders or killings committed in the commission of a felony, um, carry the the 
elevated sentence of death as a possibility. Right. But huh, it seems like this was probably a reckless homicide as opposed to an intentional murder. Right. Um, I, look, it's an issue that's very close to me and my family because a family member of mine was recently killed by someone who was driving 107 miles an hour while high. Mm -hmm. Um, He'd been smoking marijuana and taking Xanax um, before he drove 107 miles an hour. He had five prior uh, tickets for driving in excess of 20 to 40 miles over the speed limit. This was on a street, a Mm -hmm. surface street with a 40 mile an hour speed limit. And so he was going 67 miles an hour more than the speed limit. Um, And so I totally understand how that affects the families um, and how reckless that can be. But it is reckless. Um, And if someone has been stopped a number of times for doing this, and knows that it's wrong, and then gets high and does it again. That's a little different than someone who has, granted it's wrong, escaped from prison, but is fleeing. It's one of the reasons why, for example, in Los Angeles, they don't do high-speed chases mm-hmm. because they're so dangerous, and they cause deaths Right. because accidents are almost unavoidable then so uh, it's just it's just another very difficult situation and particularly because the family of the victim um, did not want that to happen and you know this is a discussion uh, you know I've also recently had with the district attorney's office and that is that they're there to represent the people and the victims of those crimes are the people I mean, very specifically the people, not generically the people. And for the governor to just ignore that seems outrageous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we say that the death penalty is supposed to be reserved for the worst of the worst. That's what the, the system of the death penalty is designed to ask that question. Was this the worst crime committed by the worst offender? And... And, and this is what we come up with. We come up with people who are horribly mentally ill and who have suffered lifetimes of horrific abuse and make these terrible, terrible mistakes or, and, and do horrible things, right? I mean, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you've brought our attention to that a few times, and it's really important to remember that they have committed horrible, horrible crimes. And we have to protect ourselves. We have to have a society that values safety. Right. Um, but – also justice, right? This this isn't justice, and it doesn't make us any safer. Right. Well, I'd like to talk about some more of the cases in Arkansas. So you had an opportunity to actually go to Arkansas and participate, and Amnesty International had a great presence there, and there were people from all over the country there, weren't there? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, there, there were people from all over the country, but honestly, the driving force were the local folks in Arkansas and in really? Little Rock. Um, and so there's an organization called Arkansas, uh, Arkansas for, oh gosh, correct me on that one. Um, there's an organization out there called Arkansas Abolish, uh, which is their local mm-hmm. anti-death penalty organization. And of course the ACLU of Arkansas and all kinds of small grassroots organizations in Arkansas that came together um, and joined with us as Amnesty International and, and other national groups um, like the, the ACLU and Equal Justice USA. Mm-hmm. And we really saw this amazing outpouring of, of support to stop these executions. So the first thing that happened, of course, is all everybody, all these organizations that worked to end the death penalty started online petitions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and everybody had their own, you know, talking to their membership and spreading it throughout our, each of our networks. And, and then, I want to I thank our listeners for participating in that because I know a number of our listeners actually signed petitions. Absolutely. Thank you absolutely. so much. And so, we, we, when I spoke with you last time, it was just a few days before this was all happening. And I know, you know, w- once you found out it was about to happen, you turned around the editing process really quickly to, to make sure that your listeners had a chance to get involved. And, and we saw a bump. We really saw a, a, an increase. Um, so in the end, we had 250,000 
petitions wow. that we hand delivered to the governor's office in boxes. We had just huge boxes of stacks and stacks of boxes of paper that we brought into the governor's office. I, I got to say a quarter of a million signatures is, is pretty unprecedented um, yeah. in, in the death penalty movement. And these were collected in just about 10 days. Well, it was such an outrageous thing right. to try to kill eight men in 10 days because your damn medicine is expiring. <laughs> It's just outrageous. <laughs> right, right. And we saw that response. People saw that. People agreed. People were appalled. Um, so then we had a rally when we when we delivered those, the boxes, the first round of boxes to the governor's office. We held a rally outside the Capitol building, pro- uh, around 500 people, easily over 400 people were there, four to 500, and um, activists from all over Little Rock. Um, Damien Eccles is someone who came. Damien Eccles was in the West Memphis Three, yeah. who, who was on death row in Arkansas before he was able to prove right. his innocence, um, and knew these eight men, right? Talked about spending his life with these men and knowing the horrors that they all wow. went through on Arkansas's death row. So he spoke to to the rally, and he brought his friend Johnny Depp, who spoke to the rally, and called on the governor to stop the executions. Um, yeah, we covered uh, the West Memphis three case uh, on on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Actually, we're we're still in the middle of covering it now, and uh, it's a pretty outrageous case when you when you look at the details. Um, it's such a it was such a literal witch hunt, um, and to have that happen in modern times, it's just it's just right. un, it's unfathomable. Again, horrific crime, but if you look at the nature of that crime. Three little eight-year-old boys were murdered. It was not done by teenagers. It was not done by people that that didn't know these kids. It was done by somebody that knew them and somebody that had a very close relationship with them. And so it, just to to have put these three guys through through hell and, and literally telling them, we're going to kill you. Right. Right. Um, it's just, <laughs> and I I didn't know this about um, about Damien, but I you know as he was present and around, I learned you know he always wears dark sunglasses and a dark hat, and I learned that's because he his vision was destroyed being in solitary confinement for for over a decade in a wow. in a box. Wow. So you you mentioned hard to believe this happens in modern times. Right. We're talking about medieval punishment on Arkansas's death row. Yeah. Johnson was sentenced to death a year later. While he spent the next 23 years on death row, Cassidy's niece and nephew grew up without a mom, and time hasn't healed their pain. We all want an end. But after more than two decades, Johnson maintains his innocence. I'm at a point right now where I'm about to lose my life for a crime in which I didn't commit. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've met Damien as well um, when, uh, when at the premiere or at a screening of West of Memphis. Mm-hmm. And as you probably know, my colleague and, and mentor, John Douglas, had gotten involved and helped move the case along that, that got them their Alford pleas at mm-hmm. least. Um, but he profiled the case and, and as, a, as a very, you know, personal cause homicide as opposed to some, you know, deranged, um, you know, devil-worshipping Teenagers. I, uh, that's what they they sold the jury, and uh, there was absolutely. And let me be unequivocal about this: there was absolutely no evidence of anything to do with devil worshiping or Satanism or anything to do with that in that crime. Yet that's who they hunted down because these guys were weird, different, outstanding. Right. You know, and and just one of the things that just that comes to mind is that how they built a case, how they even fell on these people as suspects was that kids heard other kids say that they heard that these guys had just casually confessed to having killed Hmm. these three boys. So here's teenagers who in the first time in their life committed multiple homicides and they thought it was, you know, something to talk about in the schoolyard, just outrageous. But it just goes to show you when people are different, other people can stand outside and point to them and say they're different. They did it wrong. That's right. They did something wrong. They That's right. are the ones that are responsible for this. They are the ones that are monsters because they're different from us. And I think there's one thing that I just have to mention whenever we talk about these particular cases that are so shocking and so egregious. There's such a tendency to say, well, that's an aberration. That's the exception. 
the West Memphis three, well, that was a horrific mistake, but you know, that's, that's one mistake, Mm -hmm. but we have to remember that it's actually typical. Every case is reflective of these deep seated flaws that cause mistake after mistake after mistake. Why I can go through all eight names executed in Arkansas and talk about what was what what was the mistake in this case? What was the the issue that makes this case exceptional? Well, well, none of them are exceptional. They're they're typical of a fundamentally broken system. Well, I hope you have some good news for us, though, because this is pretty depressing. I do, I do. There there actually has been a lot of good news, and I'm I'm glad you bring it up because, you know, I while we were out there in Arkansas, even. You know, the the whole country was really focused on this horrific and shocking thing happening in Little Rock. But even during that 10 day period, death penalty news was coming in that normally would have made national news, but really? but was just ignored. Um, so one thing that happened is that Ivan Telugu's was had his execution halted and his sentence commuted in Virginia. Um, Tell us I, about that case. Ivan Telugu's is very likely innocent. He. Um, there was a, a murder in Virginia, um, and the man who committed the murder picked now says that he picked up Ivan Telugu's uh, on the road. Um, and then when they were arrested, he identified Ivan as his accomplice in this murder. Um, and so that was that was the basis of his conviction. But after the conviction, he it said that, it, Mr. Telugu's was never involved in the crime whatsoever. He he was high and had just committed a crime, or committed murder when he picked him up on the side of the road, and that police had pressured him to identify Telugu's as a, a an conspirator, accomplice. an accomplice in the crime. Um, he did not even testify at Telugu's trial because he he refused to to maintain that Telugu's had been his accomplice. He he you know withdrew that, recanted that that early on. Um, and still, Telugu's was was convicted and sentenced to death. So, Governor, we, we Amnesty International um, and and others did a campaign to save Mr. Telugu's life and um, send petitions in to Governor McAuliffe in Virginia. And he did commute his sentence. He commuted his sentence to life without parole, saying he did not believe Mr. Telugu's was innocent, but that there were flaws in his trial and in his sentencing uh, uh, phase of his trial. So Mr. Telugu's was up for execution in April at the same time as these these Arkansas executions, and that was averted. And in that case, though, hopefully he still has an opportunity to prove actual innocence. Right, right. Okay. right. And that's that's so important when we're talking about innocence and the death penalty. Obviously, life without parole isn't justice if he didn't commit his crime either, um, but it means he's alive to prove his innocence, and he has that chance going forward. Uh, one of the other really important pieces of news that happened was that Rodricus Crawford was exonerated in Louisiana. Um, he was proven innocent. Charges were dropped, and he's the 158th person to be exonerated from death row in the United States since 1978. And his case is really important. There's actually a, a, a similar case happening right now. So Mr. Crawford was convicted of murdering an infant, his, his girlfriend's infant baby. But now medical evidence has proven that the infant died of natural causes of sepsis and pneumonia. So uh, Rodriguez was on death row. Um, I don't actually have on, on, hand me, uh, on hand how long he was on death row, but he was sentenced to death for a crime that never happened. Hmm. Um, and when that evidence became clear, the prosecutors dropped the charges and he's, he's now been released. Similar case is uh, Haim Sharif in Nevada, formerly named Charles Robbins, now goes by Haim Sharif. He was also convicted of murdering an infant with modern forensic evidence also now saying that the infant died of natural causes. But his prosecutor wouldn't drop all charges in his case. And instead, he took a plea agreement, accepting a plea for second degree murder and um, accepting time served as his sentence. Mm. So rather than try to defend his innocence in court one more time and go through another years long process and potentially lose and potentially lose. He simply accepted a murder conviction on his record in, ex- in exchange for going free from jail. So when I say 158 people have been exonerated from death row, that means officially exonerated and had all charges dropped against them. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't include people like Mr. Sharif and others who very likely are innocent but can't officially receive that. 
Right. And I mean, because the number from the Innocence Project is over 300, right? Well, that's not death row inmates. Right. I know. But those are 300 cases where people were convicted. Right. And later proven innocent. Right. Right. I mean, and there are hundreds at every level of the justice system. Right. But when we're talking about the death penalty, we've got now 158 who've been officially exonerated. Hmm. Okay. And then there were a couple other things, too. Some, some more on the more technical side. California um, delayed its lethal injection protocol. They still can't come up with a way to do lethal injection without causing a risk of, of a botch. And so they, um, we've, in California, still put our, our execution procedure on hold. How long has that been? Oh, the hold has now lasted um, for just over a decade for various reasons. It keeps kind of waffling back and forth, and new reasons put executions on hold in California. They could come back. Um, with Prop 66 is being litigated right now. That was our recent ballot proposition that right. claimed to speed up the death penalty. So, we, so as early as 2018, we could see executions being scheduled in California, but we saw another delay happen. There have been a, many delays over the course of the last decade. And then the FDA also had a, had a ruling in, in April in which they said they would not allow states to illegally import lethal execution drugs. So we had, you know, as mm -hmm. we, we discussed, this whole Arkansas debacle is because they, they need the drugs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of states have gone to really extreme and illegal lengths to acquire these drugs. And so the FDA has really taken a strong stand and has, has said that they will enforce their role as um, enforcing the laws when it comes to uh, importing really, chemicals. Really having having law enforcement actually follow laws, that's why is that <laughs> something that has to be like even debated? I mean of course they should. And and I mean it's it's rare enough that I've got it on my list of good news yeah, because there, there's there's been times when they haven't taken that right. stand. Well yeah, I understand that. Yeah. They were importing drugs from companies that that really had no license to import those right, drugs. Right, right. For a while, they were importing drugs that were made in the back room of, of a driving school. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, states have gone to some some weird lengths for that. So that's, I mean, I, I, all of that good news, That's those are the things that have happened in recent weeks or months. But I say all that to put Arkansas in context because um, a question I get a lot is, you know, you, I, we've been saying for years now that the death penalty is on its way out. It's it's dwindling. It's declining. Fewer executions every year. Fewer death sentences every year. Does Arkansas mean that's changing? Does Arkansas signal an uptick in the death penalty? And I think the answer is no. I yeah. think even though, you know, Arkansas executed four people in the span of a week. In, in 2016, we had 20 executions all year long. And Arkansas did four in the span of a week. So it can, I think there's a tendency to look at that and think that it's a signal of a trend in the opposite direction. But I think it's more important to look at things like Arkansas's aberrations as real outliers in this overall trend. Mm -hmm. Because even though a few states are pushing to do things like that, are pushing to have aggressive, rapid executions, those states are in an extreme minority. Um, there's the, Last year, only five states performed an execution at all, which right. means 45 states had none. And And, you know, in my thinking... What Arkansas did actually helped the abolishment of death penalty in this country. I think by doing something so outrageous, they, the, the ire of the, the general public in the United States just raised tremendously. And just to see 250,000 signatures in a very short pe period of time to try to stop those executions, I think the fact that half of them went forward and half of them didn't just – you know, just shines a light on the arbitrariness of those executions. Right. And the fact of the reasoning behind bunching them all together like that was simply the expiration of drugs that I think that really hurt the, the, the proponents of death penalty, the, the people who are actually, you know, wanting to perpetuate that. I think that actually is not what's going to happen as a result of it. Right, right. And I think that we see that um, in all of the states that aggressively pursue executions, each execution is another appalling case and another in instance of someone with an intellectual disability or a mental illness. And and each when we see those states that pursue executions so doggedly, they're the ones that illustrate why this penalty is so fundamentally flawed. Right. And, you know, it's just what gets me is, as you said, it's the people who are mentally disabled 
the people who are financially disabled, the people who don't have the wherewithal to actually put up a real defense. Um, those are the ones that are getting killed. And, and I mean, we have to be honest, racial minorities, right? If you're non-white, you have a much higher chance of being executed for a crime, particularly if your crime is committed against a white person. Well, all those reasons tell me it's unconstitutional to kill them. It's unconstitutional to do it in a way that is discriminatory. Right. And there's just no question about that. And I don't understand why we're still arguing about this in 2017. But I do think that it's on its way out. And I, I was actually just at a, um, a convention of, of um, death penalty abolitionist organizations, and I was talking to an old friend of mine from Georgia, who I, I used to work on the death penalty there. And she told me, I didn't know this, she told me that Georgia hasn't had a new death sentence in the last two years. And it's because life without parole is a more recent option and juries are opting for it. And they, juries are not sentencing people to die, Yeah, even but, in a state like Georgia. Yeah, I mean, who... Didn't they lead the country last year? In, ex in, executions. in executions, that's yeah. right. But their death row is not getting bigger. They're not sentencing more people to death. And so I think that's that's one of the ways where we're seeing the downward trend that, right. you know, the, the even the executions that happen now, they're from death sentences in the 90s, you know, when, right. when death sentencing was at its all-time high. And we're right. seeing the, the sort of trickle-down of that tough-on-crime attitude of the 90s. But these days, an ex a death sentence is a lot harder to get for a prosecutor. And I think... As the years go by, we're going to continue to see that decline. Well, that's certainly my hope, and I really appreciate what you do and what Amnesty does and, and a number of those grassroots organizations that you talked about. I am not somebody who is a proponent for criminals, but I am somebody who's a proponent for people not being killed by the United States of America. I just don't believe that it should be done. I don't know why we're still doing it today. Uh, I think there's so much that we can do to prevent death and destruction in this country. And certainly by doing it as a, as a state, we're not doing that. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, James, for coming again. And we will hopefully be talking to you again. And uh, I certainly look forward to the day when we can celebrate together on air that uh, we've completely abolished the death penalty. And I also hope that one day we could celebrate the fact that nobody is committing crimes that would kick in the death penalty. That would be a wonderful thing. But I think we have a long way to go before that is what happens in this society. Um, you know, and it's another, uh, it's another discussion completely, but the fact that the f they're so readily available any number of of weapons that you know that can kill multiple people and you can pick them up any day of the week anybody can just just makes no sense but when you look at uh, the UK for example they're just horrified at they're horrified at the fact that police officers here carry guns all the time that's how rare it is there and it's just a, it's a totally different and I have to say this, more civilized society. Mm, yeah. So tell us what's happening in the country now with respect to the death penalty. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's actually a case um, in Virginia right now. Um, who, um, William Morva is up for execution in Virginia, scheduled on July 6th. And um, Mr. Morva, like, like many of the cases we've talked about, has severe mental illness. He's been diagnosed with delusional disorder. He, was all, he had been held in jail for over a year with no mental health care whatsoever for a robbery and um, became under the control of his delusions, started telling his friends and family that he believed someone was trying to kill him, and he escaped from prison or from jail under the belief that someone was about to murder him. Mm. And in that escape, he murdered two people. Um, he, at the time of his sentencing, the, the jury heard that he had some mental health problems, but they didn't hear the full extent of it. And they really? didn't hear that he may have been under the control of his delusions at the time that he committed his crime. Yeah, because it sounds like a textbook case for the insanity plea. Did he have adequate counsel? Did he have uh, 
a good lawyer. I mean, I mean it's you. It, I, I I don't want to say the how good his lawyer was. I, I certainly don't know. He was represented by the public defenders in in Virginia, and of course they represented everybody who needed free attorneys, and they represented everyone uh, uh, accused of capital crimes. And so of course they were overworked and didn't have the full resources. Um, but also, you know, one of the things that you talked about is who knows what what happens over time as a case develops and the science of mental health has developed and the ability to diagnose and understand mental health has developed. So what time when was that conviction? So Mr. Morva's original crime happened in 2006 and then he was convicted um, and sentenced to death in 2008. And when was he actually diagnosed with? these delusional disorder. It was four years later in 2012 when um, psychologists reviewed all of the available materials um, and uh, started that process of actually a series of, of experts evaluating both Mr. Morva and his family history and, and the materials available in his case and came to the conclusion that he did suffer from delusional disorder. All right. So, I mean, it really seems like this is something that should change the sentence because clearly uh, if you're if you're just mentally incapacitated enough to not assist in your own defense, you shouldn't be tried. But if you were actually delusional at the time, and it sounds like the basis of that crime was a delusion, unless he was actually being tortured, then... <laughs> but the fact is that if that's the case, then he should not have been convicted um, of a crime, period. He, you're not criminally responsible if you're mentally incapacitated. That's the definition of insanity. If you don't know that the, what your actions are are illegal, you don't understand the nature of those actions, you can't be convicted of a crime. So it sounds like that's the case. Anyway, so what can we do? What can the listeners do to help out in this case to at least get him evaluated and, and adjudicated mentally insane? Right. So, so his execution is scheduled for next week. But the governor of Virginia, Governor McAuliffe, is reviewing his clemency application right now. So we actually have a phone action set up. I, I'm going to give you a number. And if you call this number, you'll get some instructions. You know, they'll, they'll, you'll get some background so, no, so you know what to say. And then you'll be patched through directly to the governor's office. So this number is 855-637-1740. And that's in the United States, 855-637-1740. I think you might have to add a plus one um, if you're calling from overseas. But if you're interested in trying to help out in this case, please do. Uh, but for people in the United States, that's 855-637-1740. And you can call in, learn about what you can do, how you can help, and you'll be patched directly through to the governor's office. So please, if you feel like this is an injustice, and you want to help fight for justice, please make this call. And thank you for listening to Real Crime Profile. So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family, and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Zumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the U.S., if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233.